Civil Rights Movement in 1964, the Civil Rights Act was signed. And so in doing research with my colleague Anna Kephart, who is the coordinator at our Southern Maryland Study Center, we found that there was a lot of history here in Charles County that um, we needed to share, we wanted to share. And so this evening what we'll do is Ms. Kephart will share some information with you in reference to what the Southern Maryland Study Center has to offer and what research she has done and what she's found. Then later in our program, we are going to be uh, enriched with information that's gonna be shared from the daughters of the charter member, the charter president of the Charles County branch of the NAACP, Mrs. Lanella Hauser, and then also Mrs. Eva Chesley. They're going to share their reflections with Associate Professor Dr. Cicero Fain, who uh, is a professor here at CSM. I do want to share with you that we did invite um, Reverend Rodney Young. Reverend Young, and Anna will speak to this, was um, the president of the NAACP in Charles County at the time of sit-ins that were held here in Charles County. And unfortunately, he is um, under the weather, and the temperature probably didn't help. So his daughter sent me a message and said, and I just want to read this, that you know, due to his delicate health issues, um, won't be taking the risk of having him come this evening. However, he is delighted with the idea of the celebration and regrets the fact that he will not be in attendance. They greatly appreciate the honor and recognition given to him as we celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Civil Rights Act, especially here in Charles County. I also want to share with you that while we were doing research, um, Anna and I came, found some very interesting, very interesting information. And um, the information that we knew, some of the information and some of the people, it was interesting because I'm a Charles County resident. I've lived here my entire life. So when Anna was talking about people and places, I could share with her that I knew some of those people and I knew some of those places. But um, when we were doing research, there were some freedom fighters you know, and we're not going to be able to name all of them, but, you know, we had um, a past president of the NAACP, or Mr. Golden Evans. And in um, 1988, actually, he was interviewed by the Maryland Independent. And uh, he was quoted because he indicated that uh, one evening he was coming home from the Masonic Lodge in Baltimore, and he was tired, couldn't keep his eyes open, he recalled. And he said, in his 26-year-old memory, <laughs> um, he wanted to stop. And he stopped at the Waldorf Diner to get some coffee because he was just tired. Um, he waited, he waited, was ignored until he finally realized he wasn't being served. He blurted out, I just want some coffee. And he said, to go. And they told him that there was no coffee left, although he could see the big pot that was there. Um, he left without the coffee, but he promised the good Lord that one day he'd be back, he said. And back he came with the Freedom Riders. As he was designated a guide and driver for the team of them as they traveled to segregate restaurants and taverns along 301. The first stop that day for Evans, as he recalled, was that Waldorf Diner, where earlier he had been refused service for just a cup of coffee to go. This time, he and his team were both served coffee and food without any problems. Um, from that all, same article, deputies of Sheriff Francis Garner at the time and members of the state police patrolled 301, and they kept peace the best they could. The Independent reported police feared more violence if the visits from the Freedom Riders continued. Garner, a detective today in 1988, remembers some of what happened. Some of the restaurants were pretty upset that the Freedom Riders would drive away their business when the blacks came in. Garner also said that part of the negative feeling toward the Freedom Riders was because people were coming here from outside the county. And that resonated with me because that's kind of the same messaging we, we kind of heard around Ferguson 
earlier this year that people were coming in from outside the community to um, participate. So that's something about uh, Mr. Golden Evans, another freedom fighter from uh, our local jurisdiction was uh, Salome Howard. And Mrs. Howard was also a past president of the Charles County NAACP. Um, her husband was quoted in an article in the Washington Post after her death, and he indicated that um, he saw that she had a desire to fight against segregation when she attended the funeral of Medgar Evers, and, um, a Mississippi, Mississippi civil rights leader who was shot back in 1963. He said that motivated her then and there. She worked with the NAACP, participated in protests and sit-ins in the county, advocating for employment and housing rights. She canvassed restaurants and hotels along 301 and posted signs in designated areas. She indicated that she wanted six years, uh, in the article in 2009 quoted her as saying six years ago, she expressed the dismay that young people don't know the history of the civil rights movement and the actions of the dedicated people here in Charles County. She stated, kids don't know that they couldn't just walk into a restaurant and be served or stay in a hotel overnight. She said, and I quote, we raised hell. We did some wild things and took chances. So, you know, just the powerful history that we have here, right here in Charles County. And also in our research, we identified that there were some outsiders that were a part of this fight here in Charles County. In doing our research, we found um, two ladies particularly, um, Penny Patch. And Penny Patch, um, her name was just, we just, it's just such a, it just rings off your tongue. But she actually was a student at Swarthmore College in 1962. She actually was a freshman. And in, at Swarthmore, they were having meetings about the, Southern, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And she got involved. And she actually traveled down here and was a part of some of those sit-ins, not only in Charles County, but over on the Eastern Shore. Um, we called her, and she's teaching now in Vermont, so she was, un you know, unfortunately not able to attend, but she, you know, again, echoed the sentiments of Reverend Young and said, you know, good work for ac acknowledging what happened here back in 1962. Um, we also, there was another uh, woman who was involved, and she was from Vassar, and actually authored an article from Vassar, and um, she now, uh, we indicate, we found out that she's a Buddhist monk, <laughs> up in New York, but she too had been here and been a part. So there were people, there were people who were a part of the movement that came and that were here on Route 301. So that's what we found. We found that to be exciting and really interesting. And so we wanted to just be able to celebrate our local history here and share that with you. And so I will now introduce my colleague, Anna Kephart, who is the coordinator of the Southern Maryland Study Center, so that she will make her presentation to us this evening. Thank you again. Good evening. Good evening. I'm honored to be here this evening to talk about this critically important part of Southern Maryland history, which has been so often overlooked in talking about the history of Charles County in Southern Maryland. Um, as I was so well introduced, my name is Anna Kephart, and I run the Southern Maryland Study Center here at the college, which is a small library and archive focusing on the history and culture of Southern Maryland, which we consider to be all three counties and also the southern portions of Prince George's and Anne Arundel counties. So today I'll be giving you some historical background on the Freedom Rides that took place in Charles County on three, along 301 on March 31st and April 24th, 1962. So to set the stage, 1962, what was going on? We were in Vietnam. Everybody was doing the twist. Kennedy was president. We were a few months away from the Cuban Missile Crisis. The top selling single in the United States for the month of March 1962 was Duke of Earl, sung by the African American singer Gene Chandler. Yet despite this achievement, getting a number, number one single, Gene Chandler, had he come down to visit humble Charles County, would not have been able to eat in many of the restaurants along 301. So what was going on in the Civil Rights Movement? The Freedom Rides had started in 1961. 
Freedom Riders, as they were known, were civil rights activists who rode interstate buses into the segregated southern United States. And this name caught on, and even though the, the, what we were calling Freedom Riders here in Charles County weren't necessarily getting on buses, it was a term that started to catch on for all different kinds of, of protests, all trying to, to integrate um, accommodations and, and further civil rights movements. So what was going on in Charles County at the time? On May 25th, 1961, in response to those freedom rides in Alabama, the Maryland Independent published an editorial entitled Professional Disturbers. And in this article about the quote, recent debacle in Alabama, the, the, the staff of the Independent compared the freedom riders to quote, the invasions of the communists who enslaved nations by forceful indoctrination and declared, picture, if you will, 150 or more freedom riders landing into our county to settle our internal problems. And Mr. and Mrs. Charles County, and you too would probably resort to measures not according to law to beat them out of the area. A man must protect his castle against invaders, no matter how humble. So this is the environment that the brave people who organized the freedom rides in Charles County were up against. You know, the, the editorial in your local paper has basically said, we would understand, fellow citizens of Charles County, if anybody were to do something like that here to respond with violence. So they were facing danger in doing this, which is something that I think, especially young people we were talking about today, not only young people don't necessarily know a lot about the civil rights movement, but to not also not understand the, real, the very real threat that was involved with taking part. So giving some more background about Charles County in 1962, what were, what were things like? According to some statistics from 1960, the total population in 1960 in Charles County was about 32,000, compare that to today. A little under 11,000, or almost exactly a third, were non-white. And of those, only less than 100 were other races than African Americans. So it's almost completely two-thirds Caucasian, one-third African American. And there's a lot of different things going on in Charles County right now. The population had increased by 40% over the previous 10 years from 1950 to 1960. Although for a long time tobacco had been king and this had been a predominantly agricultural economy, the biggest employers in 1960 were still manufacturing and agriculture, but between the years of 1954 and 1959, a full quarter of the farms in Charles County went out of business. So we're really in a transition period, you know, our pop and do you hear something similar to what's going on, say, since the 1990s here in Charles County? Our population is growing, our economy is changing, we have demographic changes going on, how are we going to deal with all of these changes? Is there going to be some resistance to these changes? Another thing that was going on, as you can see, this is 301 coming across the Harry Nice Bridge. And Route 301 in the 1960s was a huge tourist avenue. 95 wasn't completed yet. And so if you were trying to get your way from New York City down to Florida, you were probably gonna go down 301 because that was, that was your route. Um, and at the time, as of 1963, which is one year later than we're looking at, there were 20 motels serving tourists traveling along 301 and 30 restaurants. And in the 1963 Your Guide to Charles County, it stated that the capital investment to the service of tourists is by far the greatest business investment in the county. So we're in a period of transition. It's been farming. Now suddenly we have slot machines. We have tourists that are both coming on their way through. You know, they need a place to stay. They need a place to eat. And we're trying to get people to come down from D.C. To enter, you know, for entertainment, to, to play the slot machines. They called it Little Vegas. So, so with this strong tourism economy, even though there were 20 motels and 30 restaurants, African Americans were not allowed in many of these establishments. Many of them had signs on the door that said, white only. Some signs even said, in the words of one newspaper article about the sit-ins, Negroes and pets forbidden. 
What else was going on in Maryland? The state of Maryland had just voted down a state public accommodations bill. Schools were still segregated. Even the county fair was segregated and would be until 1964. Schools were segregated until 1965. And Luther Stuckey, who I'll be talking about, was actually one of the organizers of the African American County Fair as well. So one of the main, oh, and the last thing I wanted to point out, these are some ads from the local newspapers that show even the church. You know, I'm sure you've all heard the saying that we're never more segregated than on Sunday mornings. And even at church, in Charles County, you had congregations that had both Caucasian and African American congregants, but they had separate picnics. So you would, even though you were all worshiping together, you would have one picnic. Um, the colored congregation of St. Joseph Church, Pomfret, Maryland, will give their annual picnic. And then over here, um, for one day only, a $4 country ham and chicken dinner, St. Joseph's Church Festival. And this is the, and so you could see that everywhere, um, every element of life was segregated. So because of all of this tourism, the main, and because of this tourism and because of the underlying attitudes in Charles County, um, a lot of the organizers of the Freedom Rides realized that they weren't necessarily going to be able to play on people's morals and play on people's, you know, you should, you should do this because it's right. So they said, maybe they'll listen to their wallet. So we have a letter to the editor in the Maryland Independent of May 11, 1961, noting that thousands of people come through Charles County each year along 301. Quote, some will stop for the accommodations offered. Others will not stop to spend money where discriminatory signs are displayed, thereby, thereby causing a loss of revenue to our county. Is it too much to ask you to feed and sleep the weary, treat the sick regardless of race, creed, or color, and to remove printed signs from your establishments that point out discriminatory practices against some of God's children, and to ask you to do unto others as you would have them do unto you? So the freedom rides that took place in Charles County were part of a broader set of rides that took place throughout Maryland, mostly along different routes that were viewed as being um, financially important. So on the Eastern Shore, they were trying to show that people who were coming on vacation would be turned away. Um, coming up 40, coming out of, of DC, they were trying to show similarly that even if we can't appeal to what's right, could we at least show that you're losing out on money? So there were two sets of rides in Charles County, one on March 31st, 1962, and one on April 24th. And the first set was planned by the Civic Interest Group, which was a Baltimore organization mostly of students in association with the local chapter of the NAACP, which was headed by Luther Stuckey. And in, in, these, in these rides, students came down from various schools, as Ava mentioned. They included Vassar, Swarthmore, Yale, Adelphi, um, both African American and Caucasian, both local and from far away. And as Ava mentioned, the other prominent civil rights activists who were involved included Golden Evans, Salome Howard, Dupree Monk, and many others. So CIG and the NAACP organized these rides because in the words of Reverend Young, they were very concerned about what was going on with the Freedom Riders, and altogether, they were ready to do what should have been done and did the best they could. Reverend Young said, and when I spoke to him over the phone, that the march was, quote, an indication that we wanted to have our voices heard and that we were ready to do it. So I'll speak more about Reverend Young in a moment, but I also want to talk about Luther Stuckey because we're very lucky to have two of his daughters here with us tonight. Luther Stuckey taught school for many years in South Carolina and Maryland and was the president of the NAACP in Charles County for 24 years. He was the first African American to run for the state legislature in Charles County in 1966. He was a Mason. He worked at the Naval Propellant Plant in Indian Head for 22 years as a pipe fitter. And while he was working there, he wasn't content to just go to work every day. He, even when at work, he fought against segregated restrooms at the propellant plant. And so everywhere he goes, he's, he's fighting. As I said before, he was one of the organizers of the African American Fair, which was the, the African American counterpart to the Charles County Fair. 
And all of this he accomplished even though he was born in, back in 1894 in rural South Carolina to parents who had been born into slavery. So from the time he first got involved in the civil rights movement in 1920s, in the early 1920s until he passed in 1992, that's an incredible legacy to have, to have left both for his children who are here and for all of us as an example. Another protester uh, who I'm, I'm disappointed that you all won't get to meet because he's really a wonderful, a wonderful man was the Reverend Rodney Young, um, who at the time was the pastor at Mount Hope Baptist Church in Ironside, Maryland. Reverend Young was born in Fairmont Heights, Maryland, up in Prince George's County in 1932. He started ministry in 1950 and has been preaching and working for the church ever since. He attended the Washington Baptist Seminary where he was president of the student council, became the pastor at Mount Hope Baptist Church in Ironsides where he led a flock of about 300 worshipers, and later went on to work for an organization that coordinated other religious groups to do, uh, it's called the Council, Executive Council of Greater Washington Council of Churches. So I had the honor of speaking with Reverend Young while preparing for this talk, and he told me that his primary concern when deciding to participate was his role as the pastor. He said that as a pastor in the community, he was very motivated to take part in what was going on and to serve as an, as an example. And this example served well. Walking with him the entire way was a young 17-year-old high school student from Pamunkey High School named James Thomas, who was a member of Mount Hope and who had been baptized by Reverend Young. So the caption of this photo that you can see is Reverend Young picketing, along with behind is Mr. Thomas, and if you can see his placard says, let freedom ring in Maryland too. So the first freedom ride took place on March 31st, 1962. You can tell this is the La Plata Courthouse as it still looks today. A group of about 700 demonstrators were all scattered throughout Maryland, and about 200 of them were here in Charles County. They met up, some at the Pamunkey High School, some at the Masonic Hall, and eventually they gathered at the courthouse steps, and some walked south, some walked north, some east, some west, all in groups of about 10 to 15. So the way it worked was each group of 10 to 15 was given a list of about five restaurants, and they would either walk or were driven by locals to each restaurant and go in, order coffee, milk, and pie, wait for 15 minutes, and then leave. And if they were not served, they would go outside and pick it. So the whole event was planned to last for about two hours. And if a restaurant did not wish to serve the demonstrators, they were required to read this passage from the state law. We do not wish to serve you as a matter of our own personal choice according to Article 27 of the state law. You are therefore ordered to leave and not return. So these are a group of restaurants that the protesters visited, and I include these because you may recognize a lot of them. Some of them are still there today. Um, these included Vic's Bar and Tavern, which is now Casey Jones, Agricopia Farms Dairy, Shorty's Restaurant, the Open Hearth Restaurant, Howard Johnson's 301 Restaurant, La Plata Truck, truck Stop. And at one of these, at, and the newspaper article called it the La Plata Diner, which I wasn't able to find any reference to, but maybe any one of these restaurants. The manager reportedly threw one of the demonstrators a quarter and said, thanks for the show. We kept it, of course, said Henry Corr, who was one of the organizers. It might have been given in malice, but if he stops to think, he'll realize that the joke is really on him. His drop will help finance our bucket of tricks. Another group headed north to Waldorf, where they visited the Wigwam restaurant, which later became Wall's Bakery. Brownie Spring Lake Ta Motel, Hotel, the Caravan, Schraff's Restaurant, and the 301 Ranch. They also visited a restaurant called the Corral, which was termed an in-between, meaning were they served or not served, because the owners let the first team inside, then locked the door, turned out the lights, turned up the heat, sprayed the room with insecticide, and kept the group locked inside for over an hour. After that, it was reported that other teams were served at the Corral after the demonstrators refused to leave, but the prices were raised significantly. In addition, the manager of the 301 Ranch stopped a group before they could even get out of their car, called a county police deputy over, and read them the, the act that I read to you before they could even enter the building. 
He also refused to let a white reporter use the public phone in his building, ordering him away before you get hurt. All in all, eight of the 21 restaurants that, they, that the demonstrators visited served them. I particularly wanted to focus on Bernie Jarbo's restaurant, which is up near where Ken Dixon is today, because this is the restaurant where Reverend Young, who wasn't able to be here with us today, was arrested. And so Bernie, Bernie Jarbo's had recently been purchased by Joe Gardner. And the way Reverend Young recounted it is that, and I'm a bit confused because some Accounts say that, that there were cars, some say that they walked. Reverend Young believes that he walked all the way from the La Plata Courthouse, which is about 10 miles. So in his, in his recollection, he walked carrying picket signs. It was raining um, all the way up to the very northernmost part of Wardorf, Waldorf, almost to the PG County line. And Reverend Young told me that when he entered the restaurant, he and James Thomas, along with several others, including Penny Patch, who Ava mentioned, went into the restaurant, sat down, and then Mr. Gardner read them the Trespass Act and then called the state police where they were, who came and arrested them. Before I move on, I also want to mention that the reason I brought up Ken Dixon as well is that, as I'm sure you're all aware, Waldorf is now a thriving set of strip malls. And I don't know if you are familiar, but it seems that everywhere I go, there's little pens that say Ken Dixon on them. And I think that's because they printed up a bunch and then gave them out everywhere to use as advertising. And for me, one of the most important things that I took away from doing the research for this presentation is that even though Waldorf doesn't look like much now as far as history and, you know, when you think of history, you may think of the courthouse or old buildings. It's really been a powerful reminder for me whenever I see one of those pens or whenever I drive up and down and just see these stores to imagine that I was walking in the rain. Trying to, trying to put forth this message. So after the demonstrators, including Reverend Young, were arrested, they were taken to the La Plata police barracks where Roy Farrar, who was an authorized bondsman, bailed them out. And Luther Stuckey, who was president of the NAACP, had prearranged with a lawyer and with Mr. Farrar to be ready to bail them out. They were booked for violating the state's trespassing act. Bond was set at $100 each. Mr. Farrar posted the bond and the six were released. And then they had to go through eventually a serial, series of um, trials. Many of them ended up asking for jury trials and some, for some the charges were dismissed. After they were bailed out, the whole group of arrested protesters went to join a meeting of all of the demonstrators at the Masonic Hall in Pamunkey where they were greeted with applause. And in an, artic in an article I found, Quote, at a rally held at the Masonic Temple in Pamunkey, Maryland, Luther Stuckey, president of the Charles County NAACP, said the Freedom Riders are needed in La Plata. We tried to do it in a peaceful way, but they didn't want it like that. Now we are trying another way. In advance of this, also, the Charles County NAACP had asked for the formation of a biracial committee to develop a program for the complete desegregation of Charles County. This request was included in a letter to the Hotel, Restaurant, and Tavern Owners Association and the Chamber of Congress, and none of the groups answered. So that's what Mr. Stuckey was referring to in trying to go about it peacefully. So the, my favorite quote, actually, from this article is from Reverend Young, who, when, who went after he was jailed on trespass charges, told the audience of about 200 people that everybody should go to jail to see what it's like. He followed up with, we've got to show these writers that there are people in Charles County who understands what it means to fight for freedom. What were the reactions to this first of two freedom rides? This is a cartoon from the Maryland Independent, and I apologize, it's hard to see. It's from microfilm, which some of you may remember using way back in the day, and we still use. Um, the top it says, back to the conference table, and here, this, this table is labeled Biracial Committee of Charles County, and this gentleman, who I suppose is on the committee, is holding a newspaper that says, Freedom Riders come through Charles County. And there was an editorial accompanying this cartoon that was clearly biased and read, quote, as one demonstrator reported, he found more evidence of Negro indifference to being served in Charles County restaurants than actual bigotry on the part of white restaurant owners and operators. It also said, foundation of a biracial committee to discuss problems was proposed early last month by a local chapter of the NAACP. 
We trust that the formation of this committee, an intelligent and far-reaching suggestion, has not been hampered by last weekend's demonstrations. We urge the Chamber of Commerce, the Tavern Association, and private citizens to give more than just token consideration to the formation of this biracial committee. So basically what the editorial and the cartoon are trying to say is that um, we hope that these demonstrations that you've done aren't actually going to be counterproductive um, in trying to, to get peaceful cooperation. And the last line of the editorial, more is at stake here than just a few ripples on the surface of the county. Few other reactions I found in the newspaper were one business owner who said, my patrons are white, they support my business. I know that they did not want to be served where Negroes are served. I cannot afford to offend my customers. I would be glad to serve Negroes if the customers upon whom I depend for my living did not object. And the most interesting response I found, if you remember, Ava was talking about how Golden Evans in an article recalled not being served at the Waldorf Diner and then actually being served when he went back during the demonstrations. Um, in an April 19th issue of the Maryland Independent, the owner of the Waldorf Diner wrote into the newspaper demanding a retraction of the fact that he wanted to make sure it was very clear that they were, did not actually serve African Americans in their restaurant. And as well, uh, Robert W. Schroeder, who was the owner of the Bob Lou Dairy Mart near Waldorf, was also very unpleased that the Maryland Independent said that he served Negroes. And he said he wanted it clarified that he serves Negroes to go only and that the independent story on the Freedom Riders demonstrations did not mention this. So this, after the success of the first demonstration, a second ride, which was organized by a group called CORE, uh, took place on April 21st, 1962, with about 250 riders. Um, it was pretty similar, however, one Anecdote I wanted to bring up, I know many people have mentioned that they're familiar with Smitty's Steakhouse. And on April 21st, I found a quote about, nine students who entered Smitty's restaurant just outside the predominantly colored Pamunkey were objected to because one of them was not wearing a tie. When Clifton Henry, civic interest group member, pointed out that several other patrons also lacked ties, the manager agreed to serve the students in a back room. He also said all the tables in the main dining room were reserved. The group refused to be seated in the back room and instead volunteered to wait for a table in the main dining room, at which point the manager called the police. At the same restaurant, another diner noticed that every table had reserved signs on it, and when she asked about it, the waitress informed her that some unpleasant guests were expected. And these are some images from the Thomas P. Heaton collection, which is a collection of, of negatives that we hold in the Southern Maryland Studies Center that show um, the police had to be present when you read the Trespass Act. And these are images from that second set of demonstrations on April 24th. And so I haven't yet been able to figure out which restaurant this is. If any of you recognize it, please, I would really appreciate um, knowing more about it. But so what appears to be happening is the police are here and the owner is reading the Trespass Act to the demonstrators. And on April 24th, um, eight arrests resulted, which was a lot more than the first demonstration. But one of the arrests was actually for one of the restaurant owners who was charged with assaulting a student during a struggle over a camera that had been used to take pictures of the Crystal Bar and Restaurant. Um, this is a picture that I took uh, earlier this year. This is what the Crystal Bar, Crystal Door Bar looked like back in its heyday. And I really wanted to include this because it's, it's still there. It still looks like this. And it's it, until, actually I think a couple of weeks ago, it was owned by the VFW and used as a bingo hall. But this is another one of those things that we drive past every day and we don't think about the idea of somebody being arrested for a freedom ride in this parking lot. So I really wanted to bring that one up as well. So before we get to the really important part, which is hearing about the recollections of Mr. Stuckey's daughters, um, I wanted to end with a quote from Mr. Stuckey um, at a rally following the second set of demonstrations, which is shown in this image. He said, the darkest is just before the dawn. And speaking to the outside citizens, you know, the people from other schools who came to help. You saw we needed help and you came to help us. We are going to keep it up, children, until we break it. We're going to get first class citizenship here. 
And the last thing I wanted to leave you all with is actually a request of my own. Um, the Southern Maryland Study Center is here to try to tell the story of Southern Maryland history and culture, but we can only do that with your help. And right now, we don't have a lot of materials that tell the African American story. Um, it's really been a challenge for me. I'm passionate about African American history. This is something that I really want to bolster. But most of what we have is newspapers and this one set of negatives that were taken by a newspaper photographer. So if you know of anything, if you, if there's, if you have any old newspapers that are kicking around in your attic or you have a story that you'd like to tell us in the form of an oral history, um, please don't hesitate to get in touch with me because I would really be honored for us to be able to give those stories and materials a home. Um, so thanks for your time and thanks for listening. Thank you so much, Anna. Um, as I said, when I first started talking to Anna about this topic, the passion that she shared for the topic. So again, if you have those histories, those stories, if you have any type of documentation, please get it to her so that we can make sure that the full history of Charles County is being told. I also want to say, as um, Dr. Fain and Mrs. Chesley and uh, Mrs. Hauser come up, is that um, we just wanted to share this story. We know that looking back, and I know a lot of you here were a part of that. And you know, I, I know a lot of you were teachers when it was the schools were not were not integrated. And so what we're sharing, we just want to share the story because this is the history of the community that we live in today. And we want to record this history, and that's why we're recording it so that our students can understand what the passion that people who participated in this type of a movement had to make sure that today we can go and do things. So at this time, we're gonna invite Dr. Fain up and also Mrs. Hauser and Mrs. Chesley to come on up and we're gonna hear their story. Anna shared some of Mr. Stuckey, but now we have the children who can give their reflections on their father. Well, hello everyone. I'm. Uh... Dr. Cicero Fain, I'm a uh, associate professor here at the College of Southern Maryland. Um, I received my training from the Ohio State University and uh, my specialty areas are African American history, American history, and modern African history. Uh, my specialty area does not include Charles County. Um, so this has been an education for me. Um, and I very much appreciate Anna's work I thought it was a wonderful presentation, and I think you all would agree, and I hope that you will, uh, again, give her a round of applause. We, we, Anna and I are, are working very hard uh, on coordinate our schedule so that we can uh, present some of the artifacts that she's gathered and put it into um, a, a display case here on campus so that we can visualize and bring to life the, the uh, incredible history you have here. Um, I was born and raised in Huntington, West Virginia. Um, and it, it, Anna's presentation, even though it eliminated some really different, some stark differences in the civil rights era here versus the civil rights era in my hometown, there are also some striking similarities. Um, my hometown was about, uh, at, at its peak, about 85,000. Um, but that population was only about, at its peak, 3,500 African Americans. Um, and it was an urbanized environment, an urbanized civil rights movement. Um, and so it's, it's, to me, it's, is striking, it is commendable. In fact, it is remarkable that folks would walk and engage in the protest that you did here, as opposed to a downtown area, which folks basically could walk three to four blocks and basically hit all the restaurants that were being discriminatory. Um, but one of the, um, you, you talked about the CIG. 
we had the civic interest progressives, of which my dad was a member of. And again, it was a biracial group um, comprised of college age students. In fact, the president of the group was a white man, Tom Stafford. My dad was the vice president, uh, along with uh, some other folks. Um, and it, these things just really kind of came back to me and just really um, reiterated why African American history means to me and how important it is to keep the legacy ongoing. Um, I teach an African American history course here. This, as far as I know, I'm the first African American to actually teach an African American history course here. Um, that means something. Um, and it shows to me a sense of progressiveness here. I think I can bring things to the table, not only academically, but experientially, that um, I think will engage students in a new way. At least I hope to. And, and I think it's also gratifying to have you folks here to kind of, um, to, I think, keep the legacy, the importance of the legacy ongoing. Um, in a previous presentation that I had here on campus not too long ago, it, it occurred to me that, that, that many African American students just don't have a politicized mentality. They, they don't know what, a, they don't know you know, where to put their energies into other than trying to get the latest, you know, CD or, or tennis shoe or headphones. Um, that's some. Now, some are also out there engaging and doing wonderful things. But it really is kind of concerning to me that this kind of disconnect between not knowing what the history is, recent history, you know, and and, and recognizing that there's still work to be done. Um, and that that requires some strategic thinking, some contemplation on their part as to recognizing where we've been and where do we want to go. Many of them don't, at this point, you know, young people, you know, 19 to 20s, they don't have yet an idea of where they want to go. And for me, and I think most of you, my identity was directly related, in fact, inextricably related to my purpose in life. My identity was related to my purpose in life. And I wanted, at, at the, if at all possible, to convey it to my students that at, as you move on and, and build the house of your dreams and aspirations, that you don't forget where you came from and who you still have yet to assist in the process of achieving and acquiring and accomplishing. I'm delighted that the ladies are here because this is going to be an education for me too. Um, and I'm just going to sit back and, what is it, get a biscuit and, and some gravy, <laughs> metaphorically, and get some nourishment. Well, thank you. Okay. Good evening, everyone. It's del delightful to be here to share some of the passion that my father had for the concerns of all people, but naturally with being a black African American, his concerns were deeply rooted into the racial segregation that he encountered in his lifetime. I'm not going to give you the background history, it would take too long. I'm going to start from when he first came to Charles County in 1942. He had, he had been an educator in Charles in St. Mary's County in Baltimore prior to coming to Charles County. He was born in the South. He's from Johnsonville, South Carolina, finished Allen University. By, he was a teacher by, he taught me all the way from the second grade to the sixth grade. Mm -hmm. <laughs> anyway, but anyway, and I loved it. But um, when he came to Charles County in, in a town called Pisgah, he went to work at the, at that time it was called the Naval Powder Factory, mm -hmm. which is now the Indian Heads, whatever, 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 it's a long name, but it's the same place, just the name change. And my sister, was, who she, she's with me, she's younger than I am, so she had 
more experience on that level than I did of what was going on. So I was moving on up as I thought the ladder, getting out of that, but I'm still here. But uh, my, when my dad came, the first, uh, I think, prejudice that he encountered at Indian Head was the fact that they had signs all over the place in Indian Head saying white and Negro. He could not use, or could only use certain restrooms, could not eat in the cafeteria, blah, 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 blah. So that, at, in, in the very beginning, was a concern of his. So immediately he began to go put the, uh, in motion a process of how to get that eliminated. And I understand it took, I don't know how long it took, but he did get it done, and those signs were removed from the naval powder uh, factory. He accomplished those areas from the colored sound side. Then they had change houses where they had to do certain things at the base. Well, they had change houses for the, for the white women, change houses for the Negro women, and men and all as usual. So that, that was all changed. It made it convenient and lawful for them to work and change their clothing. I understand they had to change clothing for the, for the uh, powder stuff in which they worked in at that particular time. Well, he also became interested. He had been a member of the NAACP prior to coming to Charles County. When he did so, he got in with Mr. Wesley Key and some others, and he co-founded the Charles County branch of the NAACP and was its president for 20, 22 or 24 years. And he was very, very, very involved with that. And of course, you heard them say that uh, he started the first Freedom Ride uh, uh, process that was here in Charles County to integrate the restaurants. And he also, at that time, he became interested in, was always interested in education. And the schools were, when they got to the point that they wanted to be educated, he uh, wanted to be uh, integrated, I should say. He saw to it that the buses could transport the colored students as well as the whites. And the first case that they had in Charles County was a heart case. And uh, he was the first young uh, African-American to ride a bus going to school. And for the first year, I understand, he was the only colored blonde, Negro child on the bus going to a school. And mm -hmm. after that, they, decided, they began to um, ride the, the buses to go to school. That was also one of them. And he became a chairman. He got, well, he became involved in a lot, a lot of political activity and of silver things and uh, a lot of areas that which uh, needed some attention. He became involved in it. He was the chairman for the Association of Political Concern. And uh, he also became interested in getting other African Americans to run in general elections and encourage them to do so. I'm going to let my sister do some because she was <laughs> in school here and she knows some of the things that were happening along that area. Well, I don't know how much I know, but anyway, uh, I can reiterate that um, my father, ever since I've been in the world, he's always had an interest in other people and in their concerns, and he's always wanted to do right by people. And, and, and one of the things, and it, I think it was mentioned that it's hard to legislate uh, morality, but he always, it didn't matter what color the person was, he just wanted to see things done right. And he didn't, um, he was interested in the way people lived. He said it was a disgrace the way some of the people lived. Um, and of course, um, as my sister said, his, his battles first began when he, when he went to the, when he started working because he thought he was coming into, I guess, a better place in a sense coming to Charles, uh, Charles County um, because he left, uh, I guess, part of South Carolina um, as a teacher and he didn't want to leave that profession, but he had children and he had family to raise. So that was one of the things. So when he came to Charles, Charles County, uh, he saw so many injustices and things, and he wanted to do the right thing, and he wanted to do it the right way. So I've always known him, you know, to to just try to be a fighter for for what was right. And I, I guess I would have to help. I'll be writing letters or whatever. Uh, um, but um, we are glad that uh, he was doing the things that he was doing because hopefully he did make it a better place along with some of the other people, of course, many others. He couldn't have done this by himself. 
That is so true, and, and he always wanted everyone to be treated equally. And he, he was a great believer that everyone should work and should be, have the opportunity to have gainful employment. So he worked a lot in the area of seeking employment from other organizations to employ people of color so that they too could find ways to help take care of their family in the way that they wanted to take care of themselves. As he, he went to the telephone company, the food supermarkets, and other establishments here in Charles County. And a lot of, some of you might remember that there were, a long time ago, there was a Charles County Farmers Association. Well, he helped to organize that organization. The, the uh, Negroes, children, the law with the white children at that time were separated, but they, got, they had their own fairground. And he helped, he organized and worked with that organization for 12 years to help that. And uh, he also successfully sponsored a county fair for the Negroes. And now after that, he, he was always trying to help all mankind. He served as a bail <coughs> bondsman in Charles County for many years. And of course, they had uh, a health center where they were trying to get health for our children who needed dental work. And they had a health center in Pamunkey. They had a building. The building was called the Pamunkey Health, health Center. And they named it partially after him until after a while. I think that uh, was dissolved into a greater area when they had dentists, other dentists to come to the area who could treat our children and give them the dental needs that they need for school. Uh, there was a former building fund secretary for the Beehive Lodge. He worked with the Masons. He had fraternal organizations. He was, he was all about it, did a lot of things. And of course, not last but not least, he was a great believer in church. And uh, he was a lay leader for the Smith Chapel of United Methodist, Methodist Church. And he, he just devoted all of his life that I can remember towards advancement for the races of all mankind. That was why he always told me, he said he wanted to befriend every race, every creed, and color. And, he, and his desire was to help anyone who was in need. He believed in treating his neighbors as he would desire to be treated. It was always probably didn't happen, but that was his belief. He worked so faithfully in trying to get things done. But where he first, in fact, that's where he lived in time, life here in Charles County. It was a dirt road in Pisgah. And uh, he did a lot of work trying to get help done for people. So the county name paved that road. He was instrumental in getting that road paved. And the bus is back there. They picked my sister up from school. Mm -hmm. school. No, the bus did not go back there. It didn't come out there? No. Where did it go? <laughs> to the road? <laughs> they went to the road, yeah. See, we had to, the road was so bad that um, it goes when it there. rained, this, the, the stucky road, which is now named, when it rained, the, not only could cars get stuck, but when we walked as children, it was muddy and everything. And there was a um, there was a little bridge on the way going to meet the bus at the, at the end of the road. And when it rained, uh, the water would rise up. And we couldn't get over. We could not cross over. So <laughs> one of the neighbors, I think it's Mr. Bowman, Thomas Bowman, uh, everyone is Bowman. Energy. He would uh, he put his hip boots on. I don't even know what hip boots. He put on hip boots and would carry us over one by one over that bridge so that we could take those other you know the, the other distance to get to where the bus to, to catch the bus. And so um, that was a tremendous need, and it helped not only our family, helped everybody on that road. And of course, it's something that was necessary. I mean, this was taxpayers' money, I'm sure, paying for this, and, and this was something that was needed. So again, he just wanted to do what was good that would help all the people. So the road became paved. Yeah. And, and they named it Stucky Road. Road. And the buses do go back there. Back. So can't get back there. <laughs> but they didn't when I was growing up. <laughs> <laughs> I had to walk. But uh, I, I don't know if they have any questions, anything sure. else you can ask. Thank you for your attention. Yes. Ever what? Threatened. Excuse me. If you have questions, uh, you might come to the uh, recording. I just want to... If I... I don't... 
I don't, I never heard him say anything, like maybe you heard it, but I don't know. As, I don't remember being threatened as, you know, individuals as a child, but I do remember we were on, our, my family was on our way to uh, visit some relatives in North Carolina. Mm -hmm. And this is when my, all my brothers were living, and we stopped I was to, get, um, gas. to get gas. Mm -hmm. And my father was wearing the NAACP, the NAACP um, pink button, yes. And they would not sell him any gas and also threaten him, yes, to get off and just leave right then. So that's, the only, that's one of the main things that I remember. I'm not sure of anything else. But uh, that was it. Well, I have a question for you. No one else is going to ask. How? And I, I, I thought out to the audience since I'm a newcomer here. You know, going down 301. Where, where did blacks stop for gas? Where did blacks stop for food? Where did blacks stop for restroom or, or, or just you know just just a safe haven? Were, were there black-owned hotels or, or motels? And okay. Thank you, Mom. Um, coming across the um, divide, Prince George's County, you had uh, Moonlight Inn. A lot of y'all might remember that. And that was along the Chitlin Circuit. Okay. okay. <laughs> and you come on down, and there was. Did a, they actually serve chitlins, by the way? Uh, uh, probably. <laughs> okay, okay. Did you ask somebody else no, they that didn't. Oh, well, okay. I got to go on past then, because, you know, if you. If you're going to be on a chitlin' circuit, you got to at least serve some chitlins. Hey, but if James Brown had been there, uh, Fats Domino, you know, all the chitlin' circuit. Okay, okay. Uh, and then you would come down, and there was another place uh, down in Bell Alton, Wheelers. And there was another one up in, in, Wall, in uh, La Plata called the, somebody help me with this one. Excuse me? Willis Hopkins Hall. Willis Hall, but there was another, uh, Blue, Haven. Blue Haven. Blue Haven, yes. So those were the places that we had, had to stop along. Okay. Well, it wasn't no gas station that we owned. Pat and Gigi's. Pat and Gigi's. Pat, see? Pat okay, and Gigi's. good, good, good. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. I, and I'm going to assume that everyone knows what chitlins are because, you know, okay. Some of my students didn't. Is there anything else I'd like for me to share? Please, I mean, I'm, I'm throwing out there to the audience. And sure, and actually, she can share your stories as well. Since we're here in an educational institution, it occurs to me that I think we need to be aware that we're only telling a piece of this very large story, and that if we think about the young people that expect to learn from us, in order to make our explanation comprehensive, we've got to talk about some other stuff. For instance, when you talk about a people that is struggling for their own dignity and for their rights, the natural question is, struggling against who? And yet we rarely talk about that. You know, this nation was founded on a principle of white supremacy. All of our students need to know that. And white supremacy has continued to be the imprimatur over the society up until the present time, established through institutions. Mm -hmm. So when we look at the things that are happening to us now, it's simply an extension of that very same concept being expressed in more modern terms. Now I mention that because if you're talking to a student today about what happened way back then, and frankly, it wasn't that far back. You know, you've got to relate it to something that they can live with now so they can say, oh, now I understand why this is happening now because I know it's a continuation of what happened then. Mm -hmm. you know? And I think as educators and as researchers, we have to be very clear about that. It's okay for you to talk to elderly black people who've been involved in the civil rights uh, effort. It is equally important for you to talk to elderly white people who may have resisted those efforts. Mm. Mm. 
Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, no doubt about it. No doubt about it. Um, it it's, it's funny that you mentioned that about um, seeing the a thread, the continuum. Um, I'm showing, um, I've got two classes. I'm doing an American history class. We're watching a movie, Amistad. Um, and I'm also showing my African American history class of 12 Years a Slave, um, showing that one. Uh, that's not just, a, you know, I'm not really about singing my praises or anything, but one of the components of the assignment is how do the events in the movie relate to contemporary society, contemporary events, 1985 to 2014. And so that hopefully gets students to kind of contemplate on some of the bigger forces that are, and, and that are still out there impacting um, uh, the black circumstance. And, and I, I'm totally in agreement with you that, you know, you can't, what is it? You can't move forward unless you know where you came from. Um, and so I, I try my best to endeavor uh, to do that. Um, you know, I wouldn't be here, I would not be here if I hadn't sat at, on my front porch Listen to elders share their stories. I mean, even, even as a young cat, because, you know, I was 9, 10, 11, and I had uh, elders from the community come over and, you know, when folks sat on the front porch and talked, drank iced tea. Um, those stories stay with me for a long time and finally germinated to the point where I decided that I want to be a scholar. Um, and so my hope is that forums like this will expose our young, our youth to, to facts, to a history that would germinate, even if it's not, you know, a direct, concrete um, uh, development or, or um, achievement. But that over the course of time, it will continue to germinate and inform the way they live their lives and inform the way they want to live their lives. And then maybe even convey it on to, their, to, their, to the children and to, to others. How you doing, sir? How you doing? It's good, good seeing see you. everybody. And I definitely want to take advantage of this opportunity to um, I thank all of those that put this program together. I think this is extremely important to allow this type of uh, dialogue in our community. I, I've reached the conclusion that our history, and I'm talking about the history of the African American community in Charles County specifically, but in general, the history of this county is, is a treasure that has not been exposed. And individuals like Mr. Stuckey, and, I, and that's one thing I could say, you know, actually seeing the man in the flesh, hmm. and, and even at a stage where he was an elder, and you know, one of my um, most recent recollections, and it was just before he passed, um, there was a, uh, an event, and I believe he was celebrating his 90th birthday at the time, and it was a big celebration, and, and you know, I was a participant in organizing that event, and that's something that you know, I'll never forget, but I, I had a question because I know the theme is about the um, 1964 Civil Rights Act and its implementation. And I had a question, I, you know, and I'm reaching out to you know, our, our elders here today um, in terms of you recalling what occurred immediately after passage of the Civil Rights Act. Did you see any examples, any immediate changes in terms of the overall um, uh, Charles County uh, community at large because I I could say from a historical perspective there was still uh, lingering remnants of segregation throughout the county and I can say and even you, you you mentioned you were being you were a young kid um, I recall like it was yesterday when Charles County Public Schools officially uh, desegregated I was in the second grade and I and I recall it because it was almost like a movie hmm. I mean they 
our, literally our entire class, the classes were merged together. The African American students were on one side. It was J.C. Parks Elementary School. And they merged all the students together and that was literally how our public schools began the process of integrating. But I, I was curious, and, you know, certainly um, if on the panel you can recall anything, but I, I'd like to hear from some of the other elders if you can recall any specific remnants where th you actually saw changes after the 1964 Civil Rights Act. The difference that I saw that I was coming along I didn't go to school school here in Charles County, but the difference is that I knew what was going on, I was aware of um, all of the injustices of what was happening, and after I came out of school and began teaching in Charles County, when integration started, there was a big difference in the quality of materials that we received to work with our children. Prior to that, those of you who probably were teach could remember, we had to purchase most of the materials that we used to work with our little children. I had the primary grades. They didn't have things like scissors and paper and individual things. Maybe they, had, they gave you for, we had much larger classes too. And they didn't give you for every child. They maybe gave you maybe four or five or six for the entire grade and you had to share and work around them like that. But I did see a difference in that. Now there still was a lot to be done and a lot had to be accomplished. But material, materialistic, for getting materials together and getting them through schools and going, that incentive was there, and I did not have to spend as much money out of my little paycheck to purchase things that I needed for my classroom. And, they, and it was better organized because they were able to get others out to come out and they put more money in there for the parents to come out to help support the, the teachers. They were very supportive, mm -hmm. but at, after the, the integration, it was a better, and the schools were, I think, um, were divided a little differently, and so they were more um, eager, some of them, to get out to see what was happening. So I, I, I saw it on that level, and some of the other levels that might not have been that way made a difference, but I did see that from where I started, the red came from then on. Um, I don't have anything to add to that, but I did, I wanted to make a, a little comment with the gentleman said, was talking about the, uh, that I think the the, the uh, schools at the uh, what something was founded on white supremacy, and we just need to know. I feel like we need to know our history, the history of of the Constitution, everything what what it says about people. If we recognize that all people are created equal, and I know that um, you mentioned something about what you tell the you know blacks now. They, they have to be. You have to be taught. This needs to come up really at an early age. Um, a lot of times, um, the children uh, they believe and they act on what they hear in their own homes and different things. So it's uh, I know I'm just kind of backtracking a little bit, but I just I'm not a historian or anything, but I just wanted to just share that because we do know we cannot legislate uh, uh, morality. And, and, and we, ju we just have to, we have to treat one another as we would want to be treated. But um, that's, that's all I need to say about that. I just wanted to make a little comment about that. Would you mind if I follow about, your father was a teacher. Yes. So how was he impacted with desegregation? You know, um, you know because I know in my hometown, and in fact, through the state of West Virginia, for the most part, African-American teachers were furloughed. You know, and you brought in, you, you, you shifted African Americans over to white schools, white teachers remained, black teachers fired, let go, and then they had to go to other locales, find jobs, and of course, up with the families to do so, or, or switch professions. And so, did that, did that happen down here? Yeah. Some, I think maybe some, some, in some cases probably it did, but I, I don't think at first, and I don't know about now, I'm retired, but when I first started out, 
when they started integrating, they tried at that time, I do remember that the superintendent trying to equalize the percentage of African American teachers with the percentage of children. But to me, they didn't have an equal number of children in the schools. Okay. That's, that, was, that, that was the fallacy yeah, that I But at I least there was something there. But there was something, but I did that, see yeah. that. And, uh, okay. And then I, was, I, I had a, uh, go ahead, please. I'm yes, what I was also going to say, when my father was teaching, and he started out in South Carolina, even the school um, years, the session was different for blacks and whites. They didn't go to school during the same time. Mm -hmm. And the teacher's salaries, of course, were very different. And so that is one of the reasons that he left, left the teaching profession. Sure. And he saw all the injustice there. And then he, then he, uh, as he moved on, he still had an interest in trying to correct those things. Mm -hmm. So there's always been, you know, yeah. that difference needs to be. Yeah, I, I, I just want to also say this. What I very much appreciate about the state of Maryland, what I've seen so far in Southern Maryland, is you actually name schools after black folk. Yes. <laughs> yeah, we, don't, we don't have that in West Virginia. You know, I mean, but it, but it's, but it's, 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 it is a profoundly important statement. It is, it is more than just symbolic that your, that your institutions of higher of learning are named after black people. We don't have that in West Virginia, as far as I know. We got, you know, we got our schools named after counties or great whites. Mm -hmm. And so for you to have, you know, I've, I've seen Matthew Henson, I've seen some other folks. Seen the Parks, so we can be I mean, the, yeah. this Wade. is something that you may not, you know, since you live here, may not, you may not think about it. But well, for an outsider coming in, I'm like, okay, this is nice. This is, this is, this is something. I, I just wanted to say real quick, because I know Ava will probably not mention it, but her father was the listed party in a major lawsuit that, um, that was argued in um, federal court in Baltimore in the uh, 1960s. Um, I can't recall the exact year, um, but it was a part, the parties included um, the NAACP, but because you had to actually have someone that was considered um, someone that was actually harmed by the lawsuit, his father was, her father was listed because he was an educator in Charles County. That lawsuit uh, was very instrumental in creating more parity in the actual salaries of, of, of um, black teachers compared to white teachers in Charles County Public Schools. So even at, after integration, there were still major disparities. And many of the things that you, you raised, such as um, you know, having um, the proper um, uh, facilities and, and everything necessary to teach a child. It, it really wasn't um, uh, to the point where everything was, was equal, mm -hmm. if you will. So I, yeah. I wanted to raise that, you know, because I think there's people in this room that have direct knowledge of a lot of this history, yeah. you know. Yeah. And I, I just want to commend this young lady right here. I mean, I think, I mean, this is great for us. Oh, yes. How, did you did you folks have to have to deal with restrictive covenants that restricted you from the, that that barred you from living in certain neighborhoods? Mm -hmm. I just saw recently the covenants from my parents' house, and it did. It said, you know, it only in this little subdivision only white people okay. were allowed, and I was I'm not so shocked. Sure. Did they did they, they, they refer to black people as? Ethiopians as no, Ethiopian, to Ethiopian extract. I, no, okay. I think it's just only you just know, only, only white. white people could okay. you know, sell your property to somebody white. Okay. I have even seen an individual home sale records um, that you would even have for an individual property. You could say this property is to be owned in perpetuity by a, only a, a white, white person. Wow. So, and that I've seen those from. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. You actually, or you made a statement earlier um, in regards to our children not um, really knowing the struggles, so to speak. And as I looked at that, <clears throat> excuse me, the first Freedom Ride, which was March 21st, 1962, I was just 14 days old. Yeah. And 
a lot of this stuff, uh, or growing up, my generation kind of sat at the generation of my grandfather and my mom's feet. But somewhere along the line, we've dropped the ball. We as my generation. Our children and our grandchildren are not knowing this because we've st it, it has stopped somewhere. Mm -hmm. So if, if anything, we owe you all a big apology because we have dropped the ball. There's an old expression that says that if you don't know your history, you're bound to repeat it. And what is happening, especially with things that are going on now, it's, it's beginning to happen again. So we, or my generation, really needs to get going again and kind of pick up some things. Um, I met Ms. Morton, and it's so strange. I, well, I just believe all things do work together for the good. And she and I have just been emailing each other. I used to live in Prince George's County, but I now live in um, Manassas, Virginia, for a number of different reasons. But I am a social worker with Fairfax County Department of Family Services. And one of the tasks that I've been given is uh, <coughs> facilitating uh, healing of racism curriculum. Mm -hmm. And it's not even considered as training. It's considered as an experience. So we're trying to get our 1,900 employees through it. But I've been so much um, on the ball, so to speak, of wanting to learn more and more about the history. Because again, somewhere we've dropped the ball. And um, I just think it's up to us now to kind of pick it back up. And if we can get our children to sit at our feet and we can teach them, then they can really see where we've come from. Yeah. I agree. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. Good evening. My name is Tracy Jones, and I just, I've been a resident of Charles County for the last 10 years. And so you made a comment <coughs> regarding how um, you connect the things that happen today with things of the past. And so I saw there were slides of the Freedom Riders and the police. And you know, there's always the uprising we see in Ferguson, Missouri, and in Florida. So I was wanting to know, is this community immune from, for, for, from something happening like that? Would we have racial unrest if we were to have law enforcement shoot a, an unarmed child of color, whether that was a Hispanic child or a black child, or are, were there? Um, types of incidents like that in the 60s here where you had police officers that killed unarmed people um, for coming to protest during that time. Anyone know? No. No. If, if there, if, essentially, if, if there was violent, the police, police violence perpetrated. Could it happen here? Could it happen here? It did happen here. Is what well, I meant. Well, could. And then, was there problems? What is so special about this place? Indicate that it could That's my question is, could it happen here? And did it happen in the 60s? No. In this community? No. Hi, I'm Charles Clark. I uh, work here at the College of Southern Maryland. I've been here 40 years. Uh, i also been, thank you, I also have been uh, stationed in St. Louis, Missouri when I was in the military and uh, I didn't have a problem and I haven't had a problem in this county with races and I have seen it but I never accepted it. One is because my mother taught me that there was no one better than you including herself. So if everybody would take time to realize that there's no one better than you and color is just what God chose not our choice. And I have never felt threatened by anyone through education, through color, through having materialistic stuff or anything else because if it's something I want, I'm going to go for it. And if you got it, I'm going to be your friend because I want you to tell me how you got it. And you can call it nosy, but I'm going to learn something from you. And that's what we taught. My mother had 11 of us, no father. And I hear people using excuses all the time about not having a man in the house. Well, she was the man in the woman. And when I sat back here and heard this gentleman say, never forget where you come from, I felt to tell this story. I have a picture in my house. 
and it's a shack. We call it a shack with no windows. And this time of the year, we were putting plastic on the outside of the windows and plastic on the inside of the windows to keep the cold out. Well, my kids used to say, Daddy, you're very old-fashioned. You need to get rid of that picture. And when they would tell me that, I would fill up with tears because I wanted to tell my kids the right way why that picture was there. And the reason I kept that picture because I always want to remember where I came from. And regardless of what we have in life, and all of us sitting here, each and every one of us sitting in this room need to reach back after these kids because if I go out there, I can bring all of them in here because I take time for them. I know what it's like to have someone to ignore you, criticize you. I had it all done to me, but it didn't, it didn't tear me down. It built me up. It made me stronger. And all these kids at this college have something to offer each and every one of us sitting in here. But if you don't take time to talk with them, you lose it. So each and every one of us need to turn this story around right here. Each and every one of us sitting right here. All of us in here can make a difference. If we would take time to start talking to these kids. I had a young lady sitting out there yesterday. I didn't know her. I just strike up conversation. And she said to me when I got ready to leave, she said, thank you for talking to me. I said, excuse me? She said, you know, no one here talks to me. I don't feel like I'm accepted here. I said, honey, you are a part of my salary, and I love you, and I want you to get all your friends and bring them in here so I can get a raise. <laughs> and guess what? I want you to learn everything that it is so that when I get old, that you can stop them from putting me in a nursing home. So I'm going to get a full package from her. And, it's, it, you know, I'm making a joke out of it, but we need to reach out for our kids. We keep criticizing them. We need to tell them. I, I have nothing that I have done in life that I can't tell them that I have done that let them know that the person you see today is not the person I always was. We have to school out kids, whether they're black, white, Mexican, Puerto Rican, British. It doesn't make a difference. I met Africans here that had told me, Mr. Charles, what is it about you? I come all the way here from Ghana, and I never met anyone like you. Do you know how special that make me feel? I feel rich. I don't have any money. Don't come after me. <laughs> but I feel rich to know that my mother taught me the right thing is to learn how to love people and make people learn how to love you. It's not a thing about color, it's about respect. I can move mountains. I don't know what other gift God had for me. I sit back and I listen to all the things that people say about race. I love it when I find that you don't like me because of a color because I'm gonna learn to teach you to respect me as a person and you're gonna be my best friend and you're gonna tell someone else how I change you. That's what we need to do. Now my wife will tell you, I stay on the TV, I stay on the news. That's what teaches me what I am saying to you all today. My mother been dead 20 some years, almost 30 years, she's still living because all that she told me to do is what I continue to do, and it gets me to where I want. I didn't earn 40 years because they allowed me. I earned it because I earned it. And I earned it with everyone that I have met at this college, including each and every one of y'all sitting in this room. I learned something from everyone that God allows my eyes to make contact with. So if we would take that and use it, you don't have to get 100%. 1% per day. Here's a, a lovely young lady here. She can tell you, I make those kids respect this woman. Many days she came to me and made my day and said, thank you for showing me that you care. Am I right? <laughs> tell them, honey. Get up here. Tell them. <laughs> That's what the meeting is all about. Tell them. Make a difference. Thank you all. Mr. Charles did make a wonderful point. Um, one day I was sitting in the lounge there and the children were very, very loud. And they say some colorful things at times. 
And the uh, another lady, I'm 46, and another lady, she may be a little bit older than me, we were kind of pretty much frowned up, you know, turning our nose up at the children. But he stopped and he talked to them and told them, you know, you don't have to be that loud, quiet down and all that. He took time out of his day to teach them. And he told the other young lady that he was with them that somebody's got to teach these kids how to act. And she was saying, um, well, they're not in high school anymore. You shouldn't be acting like that. He said, somebody's got to take time to teach them how to act. And I think what you said about dropping the ball, I think that is important because not all of the younger generation have the stories and the experience. Yeah. And they do want to learn. Mm -hmm. Yes, they do want to learn. I think we have time for one. We're, I'm going to be mindful of time, so come on, Mrs. Sphinx. For the sake of time, thank you. Um, I'm Cecilia Sphinx and a product of Charles County. And it's so much that I can say, but I first want to applaud the two ladies for putting this together. This is just a, 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 a tip of the iceberg in terms of the history and the places and, and the areas. Um, I was part of the segregated schools of Charles County, and then my mentor, Salome Howard, vice president, um, was in charge of the youth council, and I was a member. I believe I was the vice president, and the president, uh, Francis Wills, is um, in the category of uh, um, missing, missing in action, Vietnam War. Anyway, um, so Mrs. Howard came to us, the youth council, uh, and said, we want you to go home, talk to your parents. I was a, my, my dad was a single parent. My mother passed early. And talk to your parents about integrating, in my case, it was the play to high school. And so we went home. And see, that time was all about education, like the two ladies said here, but your dad. And my dad said, okay. So three in my community, my girlfriends, uh, we went to the play to high school in my senior year. And that took a lot because I left uh, Belauten High School uh, in 64 and entered the Plata High School in 65. And that was called volunteer integration. We didn't have, we didn't have the tension or it was a smooth transition uh, during my time. Prince George County, north of us, they went through a lot of uh, uh, trials and tribulation in terms of integrating their schools. Uh, in terms of uh, my one year at La Plata High School, you had the academic, commercial, and general curriculum. And I was in the academic um, curriculum. I had teachers, you can tell by the language, that didn't want us there. And I had teachers who were very, who welcomed us and all that. But um, I just want to share that with you. And then in terms of the African American teachers who were part of the uh, segregated schools and when it became integrated, uh, some of them stayed because some of them lived in the county, okay, like Mr. Collins' father, okay, and then, uh, and, and um, Mrs. Barber. But there were some African-American teachers who came to us from D.C. and Prince George County, said, no, we don't want any part of this. So they, they went to uh, Washington, D.C. and, and uh, Prince George County to, to teach there and all that. But in terms of Charles County transition to, you know, integration, yeah. It was okay, from my that, standpoint. Why do you think that it was, I, it I shared of this so few of you? Was it because of, of sympathetic Gret, was it a little Well, bit, a, a little bit of both. A little bit of both? A little bit of both. Like I said, there was some, but they, they uh, I had an English teacher, and she's not with us now, but, you know, she was very, uh, she had that chemistry that she didn't want to stay in the first place, but she sort of like, it was like tolerated you. Yeah. And okay. Yeah. And uh, in terms of getting your grade worth, you know, I didn't experience that. You know, if I had a paper that I turned in, I thought it was an A paper, I got an A grade. Okay. Okay. Did they, did they go, did any teacher go, any white teacher? Was it just about teaching you, or was it also about educating? Educating, <laughs> embracing you. Okay. And I tell you what, we came from families that were about education. Yeah. And I think that also played a part where, you know, we were all on the same level. Right. Matter of fact... Um, but also at the same time, did you, did your, men, your mentality, your ethos about you, I'm here for business. I'm somebody. I'm right. 
and my parents, because that was, was what my parents taught me. Yeah. I'm somebody. Okay. So, and then I just want to share this, and I'm going to sit down. I was in the same, at the time was problems of democracy, uh, social studies uh, mm -hmm. class. Mm -hmm. I was in the same class with Frank Wade's daughter. <clears throat> Anyone who knows Frank Wade, uh, uh, the Ford Company, mm -hmm. okay, or Howard Johnson at one time. I was her during the summer. I went with the family to Rehoboth Beach, and I was the lived-in maid. Okay, case closed. Uh -huh. <laughs>